Ivan Narachazi gave his first piano concert when he was five. At the age of eight, he played a command performance at Buckingham Palace. And by 17, he was acclaimed as the world's greatest prodigy. But in the four years that followed, Narachazi was ruined as a concert pianist by bad management and his own unstable temperament. Now he's making a reluctant comeback at 75. And experts say he's quite possibly the world's finest pianist. He agreed to tell us his story and to give his first recital for television. I was a child prodigy and I started playing the piano at the age of three and a half and started to compose music at the age of four. My father gave me a toy piano when I was three and a half years old. It was a small piano, it had about an octave and a half, I would say, not more. And I played on it. So that's probably how they discovered that I had musical talent. start life over again, I probably would, would do many things differently. But still, I believe if, if I were given the opportunity to, to do it over again, I would do exactly what I did before. My fundamental attitude towards my life is now just about the same that it was 50 years ago. The hands of the child became the hands of the man. But the mind of the man remained somehow suspended between the two ages. could compose 700 scores with the potential to match those of Beethoven. Then give the compositions titles like Orgies of the Desperados, Drink is the Curse of the Working Class, Caesar, Not Julius, and Dorian Gray Sonatas. He has heroes, but they too are blends of tin soldier bravado and mental magnificence. He admires those other knights of the free spirit, Franz Liszt and Oscar Wilde. his future was embedded in stone. His first adult haircut was announced on the sidewalks of New York with the cries of the newsboys of 13 papers. The 17-year-old prodigy had conquered the old world and was beginning on the new. The walls of concert houses on Broadway, including those of Carnegie Hall, rang to the ovations that followed his playing. The protected boy who didn't even know how to tie his shoelaces was walking in the steps of the immortals. Four years later, in 1924, the sidewalks were silent, and his future was in ruins. It's happened to others. It's a sad tale, but an old one. So why is this man different? Why should the world concern itself with a light that flickered for so long, before flaring once more? in the musical field are so advanced that he must be considered in the same category with Beethoven and Chopin and Liszt and the very few elect musicians in history. He's important because he's the only musician of this caliber who came in the age of technology, whose artistry can be preserved through technology. Another four years of renewal came for Nirachazi, half a century after his fall from grace. Spearheading the revival was Gregor Benko, head of the International Piano Archives, associated with the University of Maryland. 
It's an amazing story. There's nothing quite like it in the history of music. He was born on January 19th, 1903 in Hungary. It was apparent from a very early age that this young boy was quite an extraordinary prodigy. In fact, he was the most extraordinary prodigy in history after Mozart and Saint-Saëns and Joseph Hoffmann. The four of them were about equal. And by the age of six, he was touring Europe and Scandinavia, giving concerts under the patronage of a branch of the English royal family. I went to England and played before Queen Mary in June 1911. I was at that time eight years old. The so-called command performance at Buckingham Palace. My father and I were invited to appear before the Queen, and the Prince of Wales was present also. And I gave a very interesting program for Her Majesty. At that time, my com program contained uh, Beethoven variations on God Save the King, a uh, rondo by Mozart, a waltz by Chopin, and a lyrical piece by Grieg, prelude by Rachmaninov, the second Hungarian rhapsody by Liszt, and one of my own compositions. And the Queen seems to have been very much pleased. He created such a stir that when he was a very young boy, a well-known uh, psychiatrist and psychological uh, researcher named Dr. Geza Revesh, who was the director of something called the Psychological Laboratory in Amsterdam, began studying Irwin. And eventually, some years later, he published the results of those studies. It's a very important book called The Psychology of a Musical Prodigy. It never has gone out of print. It came out in English in 1921 or 22. You see, Irwin's abilities uh, in all fields are still prodigal in the sense that he seems to know something before studying it. And he's important because his playing at the piano has the power to move people in a way no other living musician I know of has. And it's also important because not only does he have this power, but he's decided that he will give it to the world once more. Back in 1924, when he was still one of the brightest stars in the musical firmament, a number of events happened and things just started to go wrong for him. He had a manager named R.E. Johnston, who he had many disagreements with, and Irwin tried to sue Mr. Johnston. And since Irwin is the kind of personality whose uh, slightest move is capable of causing headlines, and since there were 13 daily newspapers in New York at that time, and he was a big star, uh, every aspect of the case was reported in the press, and when he lost, no manager would hire him. But it, there were other factors involved also. Well, the general fact of mismanagement is not just a lawsuit, but once one is mismanaged, then it's very difficult to, to establish a reputation that has been tarnished or blemished. Being unable to cope with the vicissitudes of life, as he calls them, uh, being a rather impractical man who really doesn't know much about cooking or taking care of himself, he was quickly reduced to living on the shuttle train on the subway between Grand Central and uh, 42nd Street in New York City. When I realized that uh, my pianistic career, so to speak, was, e uh, was ended, I accepted it as, as something inevitable against which I would, was powerless to, to do anything. In other words, I took it sort of philosophically. It didn't, put, didn't make me despondent. I hated poverty, but not so much the fact that my pianistic career is over. So it, it did not matter too much to me. It still doesn't. And the years in between saw a series of different careers. For a while, he, he would play a few concerts, but never with very much success. And after a short while, I think after 10 years of trying, 12 years of trying, Irwin just gave up. Chazzy's tumble from Broadway to oblivion wasn't immediate. He went to Hollywood. The Hungarian boy who had been captive of the piano spread his social wings through close relationships with Gloria Swanson and Bela Lugosi. 
but he was a mere tinkler for the early movies. A sight reader with a temperament that wore out his welcome. As others flew higher, he slipped behind to be claimed by obscurity in the uncertain 30s. Oscar Wilde once said that when anyone disappears, he's eventually found again in San Francisco. Here, Chazzy was true to his muse. He was found here, in the city's tenderloin, another aging face in a district of wrinkles and lines. He leads a very solitary life in a bare room, in a very cheap rooming house, in an area that's frequented by drunks and prostitutes. And he sits by himself, I conjecture, uh, composing music most of the day. And then he goes out for walks. He loves to see the panorama of the world passing before his eyes without having to get involved in it. So he walks with his cane and observes everything going on around him and then goes back to his room and composes and drinks. In all those years of second-hand existence in neighborhoods of temporary people, the impoverished near Chazi touched a keyboard only seldom. He gives a lie to every piano teacher ever born, for near Chazi never practiced. I don't miss not having a piano so much because I hear music in, in my uh, inner self and actually the actual song is not essential. So unless I really want to play for somebody or on some special occasion, I don't really miss not having a piano. That sounds very strange coming from a pianist, but it's a fact. Irwin was rediscovered in California in 1973. At that time, he had just married a woman whom eventually he described to me as the woman he loved more than Liszt himself. And since uh, he's had nine wives, this is a man who knows quite a bit about love. And his ninth wife, Elsie Swan, uh, was quite ill. She was 10 years older than he. And he needed uh, funds to care for her, to pay for her medical care. And the only method he had to get these funds was to play some concerts. An associate of ours, Mr. Terry McNeil, just through coincidence happened to be walking down the street in San Francisco one afternoon in 1973 with a little tape recorder in his hand. And he walked past the old First Presbyterian Church and saw a sign on the door that said a free piano recital was going to take place at 2 in the afternoon. And he went in and recorded the recital after he heard the first few notes. Uh, Mr. Nirachazi's playing is of the kind that you know immediately you're in the presence of something you've never experienced before. And he got in touch with me immediately afterwards and played me the tapes. And that's when I was bitten by the bug. I decided that if it was the last thing I ever did, I was going to find this man and make some recordings to this very great pianist, the greatest that I've ever heard or run into in my life, so that we could share this music with the public. Now, the man who thought of poverty as a perpetual inconvenience is being paid by the Ford Foundation, which threw away its policies to preserve something of Nirachazi for the future. His music is being recorded under the cautious care of conductor Richard Capp. I had a phonograph here in the office. Um, put it on and was literally blown away. Now, then I read Greg Benko's incredible history of the man, included with the record, and uh, I knew this was totally illogical as a project for the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation does not pick up individual artists and um, make it possible for them to record, but the larger interest here, obviously, in my mind, very simply, was, was the, in a sense, transcendental effect of this music making. Uh, that, it, that it has nothing to do with playing the piano, ultimately. It has to do with how, how you... Uh, it's a direct emotional or a, a direct communion that occurs. It's an experience. It's like an earthquake. I love music. The fact is, to me, when it's right, it is like an earthquake. And when he makes music, all of that nonsense about, well, I'm not enough of a musician to be able to pass judgment on it. I, you know, we don't do that when we see movies. We don't say, well, I'm not a film director, so I can't say whether it's a good film or a bad film. Somehow we've been taught to do that musically, and, and, and people say, well, I can't pass judgment because I'm, I'm not a musician. In this case, when the earthquake comes, there's no need to 
sit back and say, well, I can't pass judgment, it's just there, and you know it. in a sense, public confidence in the ability to love music. I think that's, that's what he will do. He is like a dictionary of adjectives. He is, if you, if you could make a list of all adjectives that exist in any language, uh, some aspect of him fulfills some part of him. He is beautiful, he is ugly, he is gentle, he is raging. Uh, it doesn't matter which direction you go, there is his, his human personality is, is um, his music is a reflection of his human personality, which is unparalleled and without limitations. Chazi is either the consummate primal man or the forever child. He is haunted by the admiration of a father 64 years dead and by the memory still bright of a domineering mother. He forgets nothing and his cares are still unraveled despite the passage of time. Irwin's mother was apparently a very strong-willed, aggressive type whose interest in his musical abilities stemmed from the amount of money it could bring to the family. My mother was mainly interested in me as a pianist, in other words, to make a pianistic career, more in, let us say, the commercial sense, rather than the deep attachment to music as such, rather as a career than as a mission or a way of life, as I now consider it to be. It's the old story of the exploited prodigy, uh, at least as much because of money as because of the art in music. And when Erwin was 11, his father, who was very different from his mother, died, and he was left in the hands of a woman that he hates very bitterly. It is quite true. My mother didn't want me to grow up and didn't want me to give the appearance of a, of a person who has grown up and therefore wanted me to wear children's clothes. And that irritated me profoundly. Their relationship ended when Erwin was 17 and they had uh, an argument on the street. She once hit him on the head with her umbrella when they were standing on the street because he was a uh, teenager and was feeling very grown up and did not want to wear short pants anymore. It wasn't an anger. It was a hurt that she wanted me to play music at that time, that to say when I was five, six, seven years old, that I didn't want the music for my concert career. You see, my mother wanted me to be a concert pianist. You can't be a concert pianist by playing Verdi and operatic songs. You cannot be a concert singer. So he left. He ran away from home. And uh, they never lived together after Irwin's age of 17, after 1920. That's when he came to America. I loved the music that my father loved and hated the music that my mother loved, you know. So my mother was very realistic, very pragmatic, and very commercial. I can't say anything to her, against her, except she wanted me to play the music I didn't want to play. nine wives in his life uh, and he hopes before he dies there'll be at least a tenth he's looking for another one right now women and music music and women in terms of Nirajazi um, I think really uh, 
it would be unfair to say that they're both the same thing. I think women are more important. Um, he's an immensely virile, alive man. My temperament required, I would say, companionship, very much so, and, and still does. So that was a tremendous problem in my life, but I tried to cope with it as well as I could. There are many interesting stories concerning his wives. My favorite concerns his third wife, whom uh, he married uh, after a whirlwind courtship. And two or three days after they were married, Erwin had an engagement to play the Beethoven Kreutzer Sonata, a violin sonata, with a well-known Hungarian violinist. And during the performance, this new wife of three days uh, yawned, and Erwin saw her yawning. And he said he couldn't live with a woman who yawned during Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata. So he went to Las Vegas to get a divorce, and the judge told him that he just couldn't grant them a divorce on the grounds that his wife had yawned during the Beethoven Sonata. And Erwin says, but Your Honor, my wife is a communist. And he was granted the divorce on the grounds that his wife was a communist. Maybe my marriage, marriage has had an adverse effect upon my musical career. I don't say that with absolute certainty, though, but there is a possibility. But I didn't get... I'm, I was married nine times, but that doesn't mean that I was divorced nine times. Three of my wives died. He was um, a passionate, romantic um, adolescent, I'd, uh, probably a pre-adolescent as well, as a matter of fact, and certainly at this stage there's no, there's no difference in that at all. He's still passionately engaged in the desire to, uh, to love emotionally, physically, and all of that. I want a woman who cooks scrambled eggs soft who gives me butter in the real way, the way it is served with the President Carter with a butter knife. I want a butter knife, that is imperative. A woman who doesn't give me a butter knife, and we get a divorce next day. She might as well say Beethoven is no good composer. I want women to adhere to my impeccable taste for service, aristocratic, no matter how poor I am. I'm an, arist I'm an aristocrat. His manner of playing is free and individual and he embellishes the scores and changes the notes the composers actually wrote. This is quite forgotten in today's world. His man has a power to change people's hearts. are wonderful. They are narrow, slender, tapered. Now, there's nothing short and stubby about them. They have, they're really, they have no hair on them. They show no signs of either old age or, uh, they, they look, they look like, like a child's hands grown up. The hands really are the expression, the innate expression. Uh, it's, it's like a sculptor chopping away everything that isn't there and winding up with his sculpture. Uh, when he plays, the hands forge the sound and they do what is, whatever is necessary to forge the sound. It's fascinating to watch them. He does play, my, I'm using my hand here. Um, there is no structuring of the hands. He doesn't, this arch, which is very important to some pianists, this indestructible arch, that's, if that's there, that's there only because it serves a function, not because it's one of those things you build in order to be able to play the piano. He tends to play like this. And the hands just sort of move over the keys the way someone touch types. It's the most uncanny thing to see him play because he makes these gigantic sounds, but you can see almost no motion in the most intense moments, when the sounds are the very largest, you cannot even see the keys being depressed in the piano. And some people have said they've seen flashes of light come out of his hand, but no movement. He is the whole that defies analysis into its several parts. It's very difficult to deal with this man personally. His mind is so vast and so complex, and his emotional reaction to a stimulus so intense Someone suggested, and it's as good a theory as any, I believe, that there's some genetic link in the rest of us that's lacking in Mr. Nirajhazi in the sense that he does not have 
a sense of the unconscious that we do. Everything in him is conscious. His memory is infallible. He never forgets anything. And everything is always at the surface. He has a, a terrible need for relationships because he is human. He may be brilliant, he may be uh, unlimited, but he's terribly human. Uh, he can accept others on, on their own terms to some extent. But I think what he can't tolerate is that others can't accept him on his own terms. If fact were as generous as fiction, Nirachazi's rediscovery would have a crescendo of happy endings. But the rages of the man's past continue irrationally and vehemently today, even against his rediscoverer. I'm not quite sure uh, why the close personal relationship I had with Irwin uh, has it, uh, come to a kind of a hiatus. Uh, all I know is what's reported back to me. I'm told that he feels that the way I pronounce my last name is incorrect and that one of the unforgivable sins I've committed is that I'm from the state of Ohio. He was a bear. I don't like anyone with a bear unless he can prove it. He wants me to adhere to a score. I play a ballad by this little safe for recording. He watches me like a hawk. I might as well be a, in a Camarillo in a trade jacket. He has no right. I must not be judged by the adherence of the score. I use the score to embroider my libido. I have a hell of a time. I don't have a good time in the bathroom. I mean the bedroom. So I do it on the concert stage. Hell with him, you know. Hell with Banker. So I don't know how, uh, how to react to that. Uh, it certainly is true that there was a very special relationship between us, and the line between love and hate is very fine. That's an old homily we all hear so often. Uh, I don't know whether I'll ever see him again, to tell you the truth. Uh, this happened once before, and in a very magnanimous mood, after a few days, he agreed to uh, allow me to come in from the outer darknesses of banishment. But uh, apparently, I've been banished once again. And so I, I just don't know uh, why this has happened or where that will lead to. I don't love him no more. I don't want a man like that who, who wants to make me smaller than I am. I want to get bigger than I am. You know, at 75 years is a long time to live um, with all of this enormous emotional span that this man has. Uh, none of it, none of it is lessened with, with uh, age, quite the contrary. It's, I think, uh, all of the accounts that I've read about him over the last 60 years, he probably hasn't changed since he was an infant. I mean, full-blown from the head of Zeus. making love to a woman. I can make the woman shake like hell. But on the other hand, I can say, sir, you're so wonderful, you're so tender. And my attitude towards a piano is very much like my attitude to, towards a woman I want to make love to. In other words, when I make love on the piano, it's really the woman. The piano is only a mirror, not too good a mirror, but, but fairly good. Actually, I don't make love to the piano. I make love to a wonderful woman. And it doesn't have to be a particular woman, just any woman. I, I love the feminine sex. express my view about life, whether I play my own compositions, which is very seldom, or the compositions of any other composer, it's the same thing. It, the important thing is not for me to play their compositions, but to express through their compositions my way of living, which, whether you accept it or not, is very important to me. I'm terribly glad if you accept it, if you don't accept it, 
I'm sorry to say I have nothing I have to do about it, you know. accept that I'm a genius. I only accept that I'm a man, a good time Charlie, you know. I'm a traveling salesman, baby, who likes to play the piano to get girls. And if you don't like it, lump it. sure whether I am a genius, whether I am a genius. Assuming that I am, I would say I will feel very humble. Whether it is my genius, let us say, or the genius of Beethoven or Liszt or Brahms or Immanuel Kant, it is subject to a power so far about the individual human being that we can't even grasp it. But we must realize it, that the ultimate cause of genius is far above the result of the genius, you know, sir. greater man than a pianist. If you said that to me, I'd just kiss you. What I mean is, it actually, sir, would matter to me more, although I play the piano rather well, if you would say to me, sir, you're a greater human being than a pianist. Are you prepared to say that? to say that. 